Hey, what's up? This is Gary from Raz Rentals. And today, today I'm in a pretty good mood. You know why? Because I finally get to review this brand new NECA Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Usagi Yojimbo. You know, I think everyone and their mother has been anticipating this release. I mean, anytime you talk to someone about the Turtles, it doesn't take long for people to start, you know, naming their favorite supporting characters. And Usagi is always in everybody's top 10. You know, Usagi and the Turtles go together like peanut butter and jelly. Or like the tortoises and the hare. Every time a new show or toy line begins, I think, so, when are we going to see Usagi? Uh, yeah, eventually, you know, I'd love to take a super deep dive into all of Usagi's appearances across all of the different Ninja Turtle continuities. But uh, in this review, I'm just going to focus on Usagi and the Fred Wolf series with, uh, you know, a little bit of uh, early Ninja Turtle Mirage comics and a little bit about the Playmates toy, so... Just in case you were wondering, because I know people who watch my channel know that I like to really go off sometimes on things. Um, so let's begin here. You know, let's get moving. Let's see this cool action figure here. Usagi comes packaged in this very awesome VHS inspired box. It looks just like the tapes we had back as kids. It's got the, uh, the painted cover, uh, which looks really nice. It even has the same uh, style of bookends. Even with the, uh, the NECA up here written just like FHE over here, Family Home Entertainment. Um, now you got to bear with me because my, uh, unfortunately when I got this in the mail from NECA, I ordered it directly from them way back when they had their pre-orders a couple months ago. The package, I don't know, maybe it's like a little crushed or something because the bottom uh, bows out a little bit, which causes it to lean forward. And unfortunately it, it keeps falling over. Um, that's the first, you know, all the other ones I've gotten from NECA have been almost pristine condition, but this one, this one was not in the best of shape. Even the back of the box is set up in almost the exact same way. I mean, look, you got another awesome painting here, just like the originals had, and you have a, an actual description of a uh, Usagi, Yojimbo, just like this has a description of the, uh, the episodes included on this VHS tape, you know? Which, that's pretty cool, because uh, on all the other NECA Ninja Turtle releases, like the two packs, they just sort of have that, like, generic Ninja Turtle information, you know, nothing that pertains to the characters within the two packs, but these deluxe uh, box sets, you know, they get the special treatment. They even get their own special name down here, the tale of Usagi Yojimbo. Now, in my opinion, this was such a great idea from NECA, you know? I love collecting these boxes just as much as I love collecting the figures inside. Now, this is volume eight, and uh, real quick, Here's a look at volumes one through seven. Man, such a collection of beautiful artwork. The painter of all of these covers is Dan Elson. Now, I cannot give Dan enough praise. All right, he does such an amazing job capturing the look and feel of all the old videotapes. I could just imagine pulling this box out of my TV stand back in the day, getting ex super excited to watch 44 minutes of uh, the Turtles with the Saki Yojimbo, the perfect length since, uh, you know, he was only in two episodes. It, uh, it probably would have cost my parents 20 bucks, but, you know, I didn't care because, you know, I was a kid and money meant nothing to me at the time. Now, I do have to point out that this cover was a joint venture. On the bottom, it reads, illustrations, Aaron Hazuri and Dan Elson. Now that's because while Dan painted the, the final cover art, Aaron made the original layouts. Personally, I love getting a chance to see the thought process behind art, you know, in cartoons. So I thought it was great that Aaron had posted these online. Uh, his expressions are filled with so much life. You know, the turtles are practically jumping off the page. One of the layouts even has the guys dressed in their hip-hop clothes or street clothes, whatever you want to call it, which is pretty awesome in my opinion because that's a nice nod to the one Usagi Yojimbo episode. The first Usagi episode, in fact. Now, while those outfits did not make the front cover, it is cool that Dan Elson had included them on the back of the box. So I guess Dan and Aaron sort of were in the same headspace when they were uh, coming up with the designs for this this cool deluxe action figure. Uh, so I highly recommend checking out Aaron's Instagram. Uh, 
That's at Cartoonist Aaron. All right. I to be honest with you, I don't know much. <laughs> I'm an old man and I don't really understand everything about how Instagram works. But uh, I will include the link to his Instagram page in the description below. And I will just tell you this, you know, that it's filled with tons of great looking art. You know, if you're a fan of the Ninja Turtles, Looney Tunes, Ren and Stimpy, classic video games, he's got you covered. All right. He's got a lot of really awesome things going on. I mean, you can see all these influences in his work, but it all comes together in a style that's completely his own. I'll also mention that uh, Aaron has a YouTube channel where he posts videos of him drawing. I mean, that's, that's pretty awesome too, you know? All right, so back to the package. On the back here, you get another great painting by Dan Elson. You know, here Leo and Usagi are fighting the classic. We're both good guys, but we don't know it yet. Maybe we can become friends when we both realize the Shredder orchestrated this whole battle. You know, he set us up, the fiend. Um, I don't know. This is just this is just a fantastic piece of art. Um, I think a really nice touch here is the uh, the glare of the moonlight on Leo's sword. You know, I, it's just for some reason that really stands out to me. And I also just love that the guys are dressed up in their street clothes uh, because I loved that episode, you know, uh, was that Enter the Shredder uh, when they had them on. That was just cool. And then also, like I said, they wear them in the one Usagi Ojimbo episode. You know, if NECA made variants of these guys in these clothes, I would buy it. I, I, I don't like admitting it, but yes, I would I would throw down another chunk of money to, to pick up these guys in these cool suits. Maybe they should just make an accessories pack with these outfits in them that you can put on your guys. That'd be even better, all right? All right, so um, the action shots look really cool, you know? Check it out. You got Usagi up here, uh, you know, leaping forward. And down here you have Usagi, uh, I guess, demonstrating his sword skills to the other Ninja Turtles. Now check it out. Down the bottom here it says, additional figures not included. Really? You mean you couldn't cram three other guys in this package at Donatello's portal? Man, I've been bamboozled. All right, up at the top here, it says, When Donatello's pandimensional portal accidentally transports Usagi Ojimbo to the sewers of New York, the rabbit Ronin meets his new allies, the Turtles, and soon learns the ways of the ninja. You see, he's a samurai. Shredder devises a devious duel to divide the dudes. It's a bogus bunny betrayal. <laughs> However, years of eating carrots have given the heroic hair 2020 vision, and he finally sees through Shredder's schemes. Reunited, the turtles and their fearless, floppy eared friend confront Shredder and save the day. Now, if that doesn't get you excited to own this action figure, I don't know what will, all right? So, on the bottom here, it lists the important people that brought this guy to you. You know, director Randy Falk. Trevor Zamet, Sculpt and Fabrication, Paul Harding, Paint Jeff Trap, uh, Mike Puzo. So many people working on this. Can't name them all, you know. Uh, illustrations, as I said, Aaron Hazuri and uh, Dan Elson. And special thanks to Stan Sakai, you know, the creator of Usagi Yojimbo. Now, something that really makes me happy about the bottom of this box is that uh, it includes all of the accessories. You know, I think NECA should do that with all of their action figures. You know, sometimes you get the two packs, you don't know what the heck the stuff is. I mean, I do because I watch all the Ninja Turtle cartoons and I'm an insane person. But just the, the, the normal person who's buying these just to collect them to have fun is not going to know what any of these devices are. Now, I don't know all of these words. So, you know, you're just going to have to bear with me as I try to pronounce them. So let's begin here. All right. Uh, hat. Hat. Cloak, Tokage, Katana, Wakazashi, Katar, Kunai, and Interchangeable, Hiads, Iers, and Hondas. All right. Awesome. I did better than I thought I would. Back to the front here. You get the front flap. And, uh, you know, you can see a very nice shot of Usagi over here standing with the sword. That's nice. And then over here, of course, you got this huge window so you can see your action figure inside. You know, and what a great idea this is. You know, this thin piece of plastic here so you can see the toy inside. Now, can you imagine how lame it would be if you couldn't see the awesome action figure inside of this box? 
You know, especially if you're a mint on card collector, if he was just completely encased in cardboard and you can never see what he looked like, that'd be so lame. All right, so, you know, I can't wait any longer. I gotta open this guy up, see if, uh, you know, he's intact with no broken parts. Hopefully, Usagi will be ready for battle and not ready for the garbage. And I will be back in a second. Ooh, just what I always wanted. My very own little bunny rabbit. You know, I will name him George, and I will hug him and pet him and squeeze him, and I will give him security, and I will keep him warm like a mother hen so he will never feel rejected or lacked for love. Uh, man, what an amazing looking action figure this guy is. You know, I think it's pretty awesome that NECA decided to include a few accessories that are inspired by the original Stan Sakai comic books. Um, I think that's a, a nice show of respect to the source material. I also think it's pretty cool that they decided to include this Qatar here because even though that's not necessarily from the Usagi Yojimbo comic books, um, you know, it's a way of them sneaking in one of the original Playmates toys into this toy line. This guy, in my opinion, just looks great. He looks just like Usagi did in the cartoon, which, you know, I'll be honest, as a kid, I thought he looked a little cutesy, you know, especially when you compared him to that original Playmates action figure. I mean, this guy looks super pissed off, you know? He looked angry, you know? He looked like he was ready for action, as opposed to Usagi, which was more respectful and mild-mannered and um, more reserved. He was a mature samurai in that cartoon. You know, I remember seeing that first Usagi Yojimbo episode back in the day and thinking, like, what? Like, how could they take this action figure who looked like he was ready for battle and turn him into this little guy over here? But what I should have been thinking was how could Playmates take Stan Sakai's elegant, honorable Usagi Yojimbo and turn him into this radical, super exaggerated Ninja Turtle and Usagi Yojimbo. So before I go over Usagi's two Fred Wolf appearances, I want to talk a little bit about what brought Stan Sakai's Usagi Yojimbo into the world of Eastman and Laird's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You know, just the few years leading up to 1989, before Usagi appeared in the third season of the Fred Wolf series. I can't say too much after that because, frankly, I don't know. You know, I haven't read too many Usagi Yojimbo comic books, and growing up, I just thought Usagi was a part of the Turtle brand, you know? I don't even remember when I found out he was this whole separate, you know, ongoing series. I think maybe it, may, it could have been in middle school when I started reading Wizard magazines, or maybe it could have been in high school when I moved to State College and I started uh, going to the comic swap. Uh, I kind of have like a memory of seeing his ongoing series there. The world was introduced to Usagi Yojimbo in the year 1984, the same year as the Ninja Turtles surfaced from the sewers. He made his first appearance in the comic Albedo Anthropomorphics number two. Um, Usagi Yojimbo translates to uh, Rabbit Bodyguard, and uh, something I had no idea about until recently is that his name is actually Miyamoto Usagi. In preparation of this video, I decided to pick up the first two trade paperbacks of Usagi Yojimbo, books one and two, The Ronin and the Samurai. Now, the, uh, book one recollects his first appearance plus all of his early appearances in uh, you know, random comics like uh, a few I issues of Critters and uh, stuff like that. And book two uh, reprints issues one through six of his first ongoing series. And uh, I will be honest with you, this is the first time I've ever read like actual Usagi Yojimbo comics. And uh, these were fantastic. You know, I have read the crossovers with the Ninja Turtles before, but these actual issues with just him... They're amazing, and, you know, I actually ordered some more because once I started reading these, I just couldn't stop. You know, I was really impressed with um, Stan Sakai's storytelling, and I felt like his art was just fantastic. Like, his uh, his line work is great. Uh, they're in black and white, you know, just like the original Turtle comics were in black and white. I love how uh, Usagi just, like, he just, like, moves so quickly with his sword, you know? Like, he you'll, you'll have him, like... He'll have just like a pose of him on the other side and you like can fill it in your heads how Usagi had like rushed through there and like cut some guy in half. Look at that. He chopped that dude's head off. So <laughs> there are some minor violent parts in this, but you know, like if you're worried about that thing, which I am not, but you know, it's just a really well done storyline. You know, I, I thought these were great. 
Um, some people said, you know, start with this because it's the first ongoing series, but I say start from the very beginning. I feel like even that first storyline with the, the goblin was just, was great, you know. My only complaint is uh, they don't reprint the covers of these comic books within these uh, collected books. Uh, I feel like you need that, you know, that's a really good uh, way to, you know, separate the chapters. They do have, like, pictures, but, I mean, I need a cover, you know. The chapter just has a picture of a blown-up panel from the, you know, the issue that it's talking about. I need the cover. All right, so, you know, uh, as I said, Usagi Yojimbo went on to have his own ongoing series. He even had um, a volume published by Mirage Comics. Mirage Comics is the, you know, Ninja Turtle, Kevin Eastman, and Peter Laird owns uh, comic book company. And I just have to say, you know, I look forward to read, finishing the rest of this original ongoing series. And, you know, I even though I haven't read many Usagi Yojimbo comics, I have nothing but respect for Stan Sakai. You know, even now in 2022, there's an ongoing Usagi Yojimbo comic being published by IDW. Um, you know, sure, there's been some gaps, especially... Um, there was a, a long one from 2012 to 2015, but, you know, he's been put, pumping out comic books for a very long time. I mean, even if you look at the Ninja Turtles, that had two guys writing and drawing those comic books, and their longest consecutive number of issues was like 13 issues or something like that. Like, if you include the micro series. Peter Laird had 32 ongoing issues with, in Volume 4 with the same artist, you know, Jim Lawson. Uh, that was mostly, I mean, that was mostly published from 2001 to 2009, so that's a ridiculous amount of time for only 32 issues. Plus, two of them came out later, you know. One was put out in 2010, but it wasn't printed until years later, and Issue 32 was printed in 2014. But, I mean, I, I do understand, you know, it's like comparing apples to oranges because... The Ninja Turtle guys had to, to deal with the huge juggernaut that was, you know, TMNT licensing. You know, like, obviously, that's going to throw a wrench in your gears and slow everything else down. I mean, they had so many things going on at once. Uh, so, you know, even though St you, Stan didn't necessarily have all that. So, luckily, he was able to just focus on this uh, comic book. And I, as I said, you know, I really, really enjoyed these issues and the art you just look at these and you're just like there's like so much movement in these pages even though you know they're they're still drawings you can easily follow them um and also the writing is just excellent you know sometimes you read stuff from the uh the mid 80s and it's a little dated you know maybe some of the the dialogue is a little stiff or um there's just an overabundance of dialogue here you read this and it just seems fresh Everything that's said is, like, important, you know, and well thought out. It's not like people are just randomly rambling on. And if they are, it's because they're, uh, you know, being funny or something. I don't know. I Like I said, I was impressed. I read both of these in a day. So how did Stan Sakai and Eastman and Laird decide to work together? Well, on YouTube, there's an Anthrocon panel from 2005, which features both Stan Sakai and Peter Laird. During this panel, Stan reveals that he was so impressed with the first issue of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles that he decided to write Eastman and Laird a letter. And in that letter, he included some fan art of the Turtles with Usagi. Um, you know, the guys love the art so much, they decided to include it as a bonus pinup in the back of the Donatello Microseries comic book. This one right here. Um... And there you go. Now down at the bottom here it says, This issue's pinup comes from the talented hand of Stan Sakai, letterer of Gru and writer-artist of Usagi Yojimbo, found in the pages of Albedo and uh, Critters. Thanks, Stan. You know, that's cool. Um, it was dated 1985. Um, Stan says in that panel that he... Uh, he decided to send him that picture to be like, hey, look how good the turtles look next to Asagi. We need to do a crossover. And eventually they did. Now, um, if you don't want to go and look for the actual um, single issues where Usagi has crossed over with the Ninja Turtles, you can pick up this book from uh, IDW Comics. This is Usagi Yojimbo Saga Book 9. And in this, it reprints some of... Uh, the Usagi ongoing, I think that's 
I'm not sure if this is the Dark Horse volume or if this is the IDW. I didn't. I haven't read the actual Usagi comics, but I have read the crossover issues. So all the way, geez Louise, all the way, page 348, you begin the Ninja Turtle crossovers. And they go until the, uh, looks like the end of the book here. There's, there's a lot of great stuff in here that I'll cover in a second. To begin with, there's a really nice introduction here by Peter Laird, where he says that the turtle dudes and Sakai were corresponding uh, long before that picture was sent. I guess they were both, um, you know, complimenting each other over their amazing comic books, independent comic books. Um, and, uh, you know, it says about how, like, that pinup should be considered the first Usagi Yojimbo and TMNT crossover. Now, unfortunately, that pinup is not in this book. I don't know why I wouldn't put it in it. Uh, in that panel um, from Anthrocon, Stan seems a little embarrassed by it or something like that. But you'd think that they would throw it in here just because of, you know, how important it was. So the first crossover is Turtle Soup and Rabbit Stew. Um, now, that was actually originally printed. It's printed here, you see. Um, but it was actually originally printed in the um, the Turtle Soup comic book. Uh, that was published in September of 1987. Turtle Soup was an anthology book that featured um, different stories by different artists. And uh, hopefully I didn't pass it. And here inside of Turtle Soup, you can see the very first Ninja Turtle Usagi Yojibo crossover, Turtle Soup and Rabbit Stew. Or as I said, you could also look in uh, that Usagi Yojimbo Saga book nine. Uh, Basically, what's going on here is Leonardo is uh, mysteriously transported to Usagi's world, you know. He doesn't know exactly what's going on here. He thinks that maybe it has some kind of, it's some kind of after effect of meeting up with Rene, but it's never really fully explained. Um, and it just gets funnier in, like, the third appearance or crossover between Leonardo and uh, Usagi. So he lands up in Usagi's world. He encounters a, um, uh, what are they called, uh, Takage. And almost immediately, he gets attacked by Samurai. At the same time that Usagi Yojimbo is getting attacked by some Nico Ninja Clan ninjas. You see, the, the thing is, uh, ninjas and Samurai do not get along. They don't like each other, all right? You know, they have a different honor system. Uh, or maybe ninjas don't even have honor. <laughs> but Samurais do, you know, they have Bushido. So, of course, this battle collides. And, you know, this is like an awesome shot here. And in the end, the only two people left standing are Leonardo and Usagi Yojimbo. And they both mistaken each other to be, you know, enemies. Because Leonardo's a ninja and uh, Usagi's dressed up like a samurai. Just as they're about to uh, fight here, Leonardo mysteriously vanishes uh, and gets sent back to New York. Leaving Usagi to proclaim, you know, I hate ninja. Uh... Very short, but it ends on a funny note, you know, where uh, Leonardo is trying to explain to the other turtles about uh, this rabbit he encountered, and they're all like, you're crazy, dude. Um, you know, a very uh, humorous, very enjoyable first encounter. All right, now back to the textbook, because uh, I do not own the actual issue that the uh, next crossover appears in. But uh, all right, so 1987. 1987 was actually a pretty exciting year for uh, Eastman and Laird. You know, this was the year that they began working with Playmates on their action figure line, and uh, it was also the year they began working with uh, Fred Wolf on the cartoon. So when the guys flew out to San Diego Comic-Con, which I looked up, it ran from August 6th through uh, August 9th, 1987, they finally met Stan Sakai in person, <laughs> and, they, uh, and they proposed, hey, you know, we should include Usagi Yojimbo in our Ninja Turtle line. Peter Laird said in that Anthrocon panel that he thought Usagi would make a great toy, and thankfully, Stan allowed Eastman and Laird to include him, you know, and I'm sure he made out pretty well off of the, the deal, too, I would imagine, uh, or at least I would hope so. <laughs> All I know is I'm happy about it, because I couldn't imagine playing with my Ninja Turtle toys back in the day without Usagi Yojimbo. All right, and then in uh, 1988, Usagi uh, number 10 was published, all right? So that's where the, the next story comes from. 
And uh, luckily, the back of this saga book has the actual covers. So right there, you can see the cover of Usagi Yojimbo Volume 10. It's got Leonardo right on the cover. All right, uh, so this story is different than the first one because uh, this one is not written and drawn by Stan Sakai. It's actually drawn by and written by, uh, by Peter Laird. Now, this story is actually a few things, all right? First, it's a lesson Usagi is telling about arrogance. Um, it's also an homage to uh, one of Peter Laird's favorite Robin Hood tales. And it's also the second encounter Usagi has with Leonardo. It doesn't say how Leonardo came to this world. There's no, like... This is, I guess, where the first one was written in Leonardo's point of view. This is more of Usagi's point of view. Uh, because Usagi... There's no explanation why Leonardo is back in Usagi's time, and he doesn't disappear like he did at the end of the first one. So in this one, uh, the, the the two warriors actually battle, you know? Uh, they have a, a pretty nice-looking fight. And uh, who comes out on top, you know? Samurai or ninja? Well, in the end, the two become friends, you know? <laughs> Usagi trips... Leo, I guess, could have bested him here, but, and, but uh, instead he, you know, reaches to help him up, and they become buddies. You know, just in time for uh, future Ninja Turtle storylines. It's a very short, but a very decent one. You know, it's very interesting to see Peter Laird's art, you know, because if you look at all the other Usagi Ojimbo, Stan Sakai has a very, uh, you know, his likeness is usually pretty consistent. You know, he has an actual model for how he draws Usagi Ojimbo. So it's kind of interesting to see Peter Laird's take on him, you know. It's kind of like when you're looking at the guest era of Mirage Comics during Volume 1. Um, I do like um, Peter Laird's, like, backgrounds and stuff like that. I think those are really well done. It doesn't necessarily have the same um, energy that uh, Stan Sakai draws with um, Usagi. You know, I feel like... This is a little slower paced, but it's just a good story. You know, my if if I had one complaint, it's a uh, this um, set of panels right here, right? It's like such a high up shot of Usagi battling Leonardo, and I guess it's nice because it's showing you how far they're fighting each other. You know, they're fighting down the river, but um, you know, I feel like it would have been cool to have more close up shots of them fighting. You know, I would imagine uh, Eastman would have done a really good job of. Um, you know, laying out all those battle shots between the two of them. All right, so now we're at 1989. And 1989 was definitely the biggest year of uh, the Ninja Turtles working with Usagi Yojimbo, you know, working with each other to make some money. So, uh, you know, first we'll finish off the cartoon or the comic books, and then I'll talk a little bit about the Playmates action figure, and then I will finish this uh, with going over the, uh, the two episodes from the Fred Wolf series. So in December of 1989, Mirage Comic Books published Shell Shock, and it featured this final Usagi Yojimbo storyline, The Treaty. Um, Shell Shock was another anthology book, or I guess it's more of a collected book, because it collects a ton of um, Ninja Turtle shorts that were already published, plus a few brand new ones. And, you know, included in the brand new shorts is uh, The Treaty by Stan Sakai. Um, and if you don't have this book, you need to find it because it's awesome. Look at that. He got the second book. Who who had the first storyline? Oh, it's a Jim Lawson one. All right. So, you know, I don't want to... <laughs> it's actually pretty, uh, pretty close to white, you know? It's not as off-white as I thought the pages were going to be, but I'm going to talk about it using the... Um, the saga collected book here. All right, so this third crossover was written and drawn by Stan Sakai. And it's sort of, it, and it features the same energy, humor, and action that the, the first crossover had, all right? Uh, you know, first you have Leonardo returning home after picking up some pizza, and all of a sudden, he gets transported. Just pop. He explains that, you know, he fell through one of those time-space portals. Once again, Leonardo was transported to Usagi Yojimbo's world, and as soon as he gets here, he finds Usagi being surrounded by these Nico uh, ninjas. And uh, I'm pretty sure, doesn't Nico mean cat? 
Isn't that what that means? Isn't that like Nico from Secret of Mana? Uh, so, you know, Leonardo helps Usagi fight all these guys off. Usagi recognizes him. He knows who he is. Uh, this continues, you know, one, two, and three. The continuity is intact here. So whatever happened in those first two is, uh, you know, still relevant here. So he fights off the ninjas, and then he starts walking with uh, Usagi, where Usagi explains that uh, he is um, delivering a treaty, and the ninja's master wants it for his own purposes. You know, he wants to get this treaty. Uh, so I don't want to spoil the end of the story, because I feel like, you know, you should pick it up and read it. You know, it's a good thing. Again, you know, I think this is a really fun tale, um, and I just love the panels. I love the way he, uh, you know, layouts the the action. And I also just love his expressions. I think he does a really good job making, like, some silly-looking faces, or he can make the characters look serious. Uh, I love here this shot where um, Leonardo admits to Asagi that, you know, he lives in a sewer with the other turtles. I also really enjoy just the adventurous nature of this tale, you know. I love how uh, Leonardo just keeps on getting transported to this mysterious land where he meets new people and fights new enemies, you know? I love exploration stories like that. I also think it's great that, like, you know, Leonardo's time is always cut really short, you know? Like, he's just standing there, and before, like, the story can actually be resolved, he'll, like, disappear and get sent back to New York. It's always abrupt. And in the end, it just kind of makes for a really funny joke, you know, where uh, the one Ninja Turtle closes the window, and Leonardo accidentally crashes through it. And once again, it ends with uh, you know, Leonardo trying to explain to everybody that uh, he was in a different land hanging out with a samurai rabbit, and everybody else thinks that he is crazy. So very briefly, I do just kind of want to mention this, that uh, there are two other storylines in here of uh, Usagi and Ninja Turtle crossovers. The first one is Shades of Green. Uh, this came out later. This was actually published in 1993, and uh, um, it was the first three issues of Osagi Yojimbo Volume 2, which was published by Mirage Comics. So, so Usagi and his pal Gen. Gen is always trying to make money, you know, he's a bounty hunter, uh, but here they get attacked by some Nico ninjas, and, uh, you know, it doesn't take long for them to uh, encounter this, uh, this sensei named... Kakara. And, uh, uh, look at that guy. That guy looks like a Mirage-drawn Splinter. You know, he looks like Splinter from the very early issues of Mirage Comics. And I even looked up what Kakara, uh, translates to, and it translates to Fragment. So, you know, Fragment, Splinter, eh? You get it? Kakara says he needs Usagi and Gen to, uh, help him with some things. You know, he needs some protection. Um, but he needs more, you know, he needs more help, so he uses his magical powers to um, transport the Ninja Turtles to Asagi's land. And this time he actually transports all four of them. Now, what I do really appreciate in these, uh, you know, these Usagi Yojimbo comics is uh, Stan Sakai will write Japanese words sometimes. And then right below that, he will write the English words. So it's like I'm learning how to speak Japanese as I'm reading this story, you know. So if you're looking for a book for your kids this Christmas, pick <laughs> pick up Usagi Ojimbo. And I don't know, the guys look great in this comic book. I wasn't the only one confused about Kakura's appearance because even these guys think that Kakura looks like Master Splinter, but he's different, you know. Um, I don't know. There's there's lots to really love about this. Again, the action is fantastic, and the panel storytelling is just wonderful you know i love this this uh group of panels on these pages right here where there's not even any words you know you're just following the ninja through the forest and then you're watching leonardo watch the ninja move and then leonardo follows you know i don't know like i used to um uh, i used, i would do storyboards and stuff like that for companies and i don't know i just love planning out stories you know it's it's one of the coolest things is you like take like a, a paragraph somebody written about something and you're like, OK, well, how am I going to actually show this in a in a visual way? Very effortlessly, Stan is able to lead you through a story, you know, and he does it with, uh, you know, by conveying mood and also just, you know, keeping your attention with these very dynamic panels. You know, I think his use of uh, like framing 
is great and his compositions are just you know spot on like as an artist i really enjoy uh seeing what he lays down on the page i love when this guy gets shot in the head with the arrow and you just have that trail of blood flying through the air you know that is that's pretty cool looking i love when bad guys are dead you have this little death bubble coming out of their body i also really like when the character chizu jizu <sighs> I, I cannot pronounce these uh, names appropriately. Uh, I love it how she has a blade hidden in her stick, you know, much like the 1988 Splinter action figure. And uh, I don't know. It's just a very fun tale. You know, it's I think it's like 60 pages, but it just flows by so quickly. All right. Now the final crossover that I'm going to mention. And this one is different from the uh, the uh, the other crossovers for a few reasons. And I don't have this. I don't understand why I don't own this. I, I don't know why I did not pick up this uh, this crossover when it first came out. How did I miss this? Maybe my store didn't get it or something. Because I always get everything Ninja Turtles. So, uh, all right. This is another great crossover. But as I said, you know, it's different. First of all, it's printed in color. It came out in ninth or it came out in twenty seventeen. Again, the action in this comic book is, uh, you know, awesome. The, uh, the, the the drawings are all great, you know. It seems like um, since the 80s, Stan has loosened up a little bit with how he uh, draws Usagi. He, uh, I don't know, he's a little more cartoony now. You know, I feel like his, his model that he was using before was uh, a little more solid or something. Not that that's a, a bad thing necessarily, just that, you know, his uh, style has just changed a little bit over, you know, for almost 40 years. But, you know, who... Who can blame him? So, uh, all right. Usagi here once again runs into uh, Kakara, uh, and he is in need of help. This time, Kakara does not look like a Mirage Splinter. You know, he doesn't have that black all over his face. And, uh, you know, Kakara needs his help. And once again, he summons the Ninja Turtles. Now, this is interesting because um, these are not the same Ninja Turtles. These are not the Mirage comic books Ninja Turtles. And Usagi is actually confused. You know, he's like, who are you? Are you a possessed demon? But um, these are actually the IDW comic book Ninja Turtles, which is interesting. You know, I'm not the hugest fan of uh, multiverse storylines. I feel like they are so overdone and I get so sick and tired of them. Like, I don't care about any of these new Spider-Men that come out. But I do like the, the Ninja Turtle multiverse. I think some of that is because, um, you know, every Ninja Turtle universe is its own thing. You know, it's either the cartoon from the 80s, the cartoon from the 2003, the 2012 cartoon, you know, or the Mirage comic books, IDW comic books. Every single one of these Ninja Turtle timelines has succeeded in their own way. You know, they became their own thing and they became popular and they've lasted a long time. So, like, I don't need... A Ninja Turtle multiverse crossover, but it's just kind of cool whenever they have them. You know, it's like a bonus because I can appreciate, you know, the 87 cartoon, the 2003 cartoon by themselves, but it's just kind of neat when you combine them. Almost every timeline has already gained, you know, their own popularity and proved that they're worthy of a multiverse crossover. And that's it. You know, I got to end by talking about like this shot right here. Like that is amazing. Um, you know, this is a very good book to pick up. Like I said, the uh, the movement of the panels is very nice. The characters look like they're moving on the page. Um, and then, as I said before, the back of this has, uh, you know, all the covers. These are the Usagi, Yojimbo covers. But then it has all the uh, the crossover covers, like Turtle Soup, Usagi 10, Shell Shock, the first three issues of uh, Usagi and Mirage, and then, like, a ton of variant covers from that, uh, Namutsu. Is that how you pronounce that? How about I just call it the Big Fish story? All right, let's move on. So before I talk about the two 1989 Fred Wolf episodes featuring Usagi Ojimbo, I just want to briefly talk about the 1989 Playmates action figure, because this guy was the introduction to Usagi Ojimbo for me, at least. Uh, you know, I had this guy for a while before I saw those episodes. Uh, I guess just a couple months, but you know, whatever. Um, this guy looks a little different, as I said before. You know, his face is totally angry, you know. Sometimes Usagi does look, you know, angered. 
whenever he's attacking people and killing them. But this one just looks, you know, way more in the uh, the style of TMNT. Um, he does have the eyebrow line. Like, Usagi Ojimbo always has that pronounced eye uh, eyebrow. It's like his distinct look. Um, and he's also dressed up in samurai armor, which Usagi usually does not wear uh, samurai armor in the comic books that I've read. You know, only during the, um, like, the flashbacks he'll wear it whenever he's, like, protecting Lord Mifune in battle. Um, usually he's just walking around in his kimono. This action figure also does not have the, uh, the Lord Mifune symbol on it anywhere. It does appear in the Fred Wolf series, but not on this guy. This Playmates action figure came with the, uh, the trademark Usagi Yojimbo weapons. You know, he has the katana, and he has the, the wakazashi. Uh, he also did come with a, uh, a tanto, this little dagger. And he also has this, uh, I think it's like Naganati is how you pronounce it. N-A-G-A-N-A-T-I? Or wait, no, N-A-G-I-N-A-T-A. -A -A. Nagi Nada. <laughs> I apologize for my ignorance. Um, so, you know, he came with a lot of cool weapons. A lot of neat things and I'd never forgive myself if I didn't mention that he also came with a fist dagger as a kid I thought this guy just looked like such a great warrior you know and the perfect buddy for the Ninja Turtles he fit in so well with all the toys from 1989 plus the ones from 1988 I'm sure I could have been the only one who thought Usagi Ojimbo was a Ninja Turtle character and then later found out that he wasn't um, you know I just I just thought this dude was this totally radical samurai rabbit who looked all super angry and was ready for battle. So you can imagine how confused I was when I saw the season 3 episode Usagi Yojimbo, which premiered on November 7th, 1989. As the episode begins, the guys are trying to perform an incredibly important task. Return a videotape to the video rental store before it closes. I think we've all been there, right? You know? Well, all of us who were renting tapes 40 years ago. So, do the guys succeed in getting the tape back in time? No. Bummer. Now they're going to have to pay that $1.50 or whatever it is in late fees. And if that wasn't bad enough, all of a sudden, General Trag transports right in front of them. Now, barely a battle takes place as Trag almost instantly disappears. Donatello deduces that Krang must be messing with his dimensional portal. So he leads the other turtles back to the sewer lair, where he tries to make contact with the neutrinos. You see, he's hoping that they might have some kind of clue about what Krang is up to. This episode actually introduces Donatello's pan-dimensional portal. That's that big thing right there. As Donatello attempts to contact the neutrinos, down in the Technodrome, the Shredder tries to use his brand new teleporter. Unlike Krang's transdimensional portal, Shredder's brand new teleporter transports material objects to a predetermined location. Isn't that what the transdimensional portal does? Now, this teleporter causes interference with Donatello's transdimensional reception. Boy, what are the odds on that? So, Donatello's signal is sent to the wrong dimension. Instead of Dimension X, it stumbles upon a dimension that looks like 17th century Japan. Only, this isn't our Japan, no. This is the Japan of an alternative Earth, where animals became the dominant species. And who do they discover there? Why, Usagi Yojimbo. Now, things are not looking too good for Usagi, you know. Uh, he's getting attacked by three samurai pigs. If you've read any of the comics, you probably already know that, you know, things are not going to end well for the pigs. Well, I mean, this is a Fred Wolf cartoon, so, you know, all Usagi does is throw one into the other one and he kicks the one guy. You know, that's it. Uh, after a very short battle, Usagi jumps through Donatello's portal and he starts to kick the turtle's butts. He says that he thinks that they were sent by Lord Bassan to stop him. But I mean, come on, Usagi. You know, shouldn't you have done the honorable thing and... You know, try to talk to them before you attack them. I mean, he really mops the floor with them. He does get into a cool sword fight with Leonardo, and he even compliments Leonardo's sword skills. Usagi is able to pull a dagger, or a kunai, right, out of his uh, the handle of his katana. 
and he throws it at Leo. Um, now, this brand new action figure does not have that ability, if you were wondering, but uh, that would have been cool if they would have included that. You know, maybe that could have been like his little Tonto or whatever. Hey, did you know that Tontos were the primary weapon used for seppuku? All right, so Leonardo is bested. You know, he loses. And uh, the only thing that stops Usagi Ojimbo is Mikey throws a pizza in his face. And Splinter takes his sword away. Usagi is so impressed with this technique, he asks, What technique was that? And Splinter tells him, It's slapstick. He probably should have used the curly maneuver. Now, here they have a little bit of exposition, you know. Uh, they do a good job of filling you in on some of the basics of the comic, you know. He says his name is Usagi Ojimbo, which Splinter says means rabbit bodyguard. And he also says that uh, he is a ronin, a masterless samurai. Uh, there is no mention that his name is Miyamoto Usagi. He's just Usagi Ojimbo. In my opinion, I actually think that his likeness is pretty decent. You know, I think he he looks pretty similar to the, the comic version uh, that Stan Sakai drew. Unlike the Playmates action figure, he wears the kimono just like he does in the comic books. You know, he's got the the blue top and his uh, his pants are uh, black, which is how it appears. Like with, if you look at the comic book page, Usagi's pants look black, but uh, from what I understand, they're actually supposed to be like a navy blue color. But I think the black looks nice, you know, it's it's a nice contrast. He's got those like scruffy cheeks and, uh, you know, in my opinion, just his face is very similar to a Stan Sakai drawing. It's just like softer or something like that. He just kind of appears like, you know, more kid friendly. Personality wise, I, like, I don't know if he's exactly the same as the original comic book. You know, I think in this cartoon, he seems to have more of like a child's innocence you know, uh, some of that is because he is a stranger in our world. And also some of that seems like because he's like a little naive or something. In the comic books, he seems more wise, you know. He's a he's a very experienced, mature samurai. Or at least that's how I took it, you know. Um, so he does have the same Bushido or a sense of honor uh, or code of honor <laughs> uh, in this cartoon. After everybody gets acquainted, Donatello says that at the moment, he is unable to send Usagi back to his home dimension. So, for the time being, Usagi joins the Turtles team. The guys decide to head to Channel 6, so they give Usagi a cool disguise, and they put on their street clothes. Donatello says when the Shredder uses his portal, all the electronics in the city go haywire. So he thinks Channel 6 will be the best place to be to figure out uh, Shredder's plan or something like that. I don't know. It's it's an okay explanation why they're heading to Channel 6. I, I, I don't really know. It's, it's, it's not important. On the way, Usagi plays uh, some street games, and he wins a ton of stuffed animals. Uh, when they get to the Channel 6 building... Irma is delighted when Usagi gifts all of these stuffed animals to her. Finally, a man who's interested in her. And, uh, oh, oh, oh wait, he's a rabbit? Man, poor man-hungry Irma. Poor girl. Um, April tells the guys to uh, head to Midtown in order to find the source of Shredder's energy disturbance. Why? Well, no reason. No real reason, <laughs> other than... It worked for her. What, what is that? Here they find a portal and an army of foot soldiers. Here is uh, actually one of my favorite foot soldier battles in the whole cartoon, all right? Because Usagi is allowed to completely slaughter these dudes. You know, he's just allowed to chop them up to bits. There's only a few instances in the cartoon where the robotic foot soldiers get hacked to pieces. And, uh, you know, this is one of the best. Who does Usagi think he is? Kung Lao? All right, so Donatello picks up a power pack, uh, which I guess was inside of one of the foot soldiers, you know, and he hopes to use it to uh, home in on the frequency the foot soldiers were using to get to New York. Meanwhile, Usagi sees a guy on a motorcycle and he follows him. You know, he mistakenly thinks that he could be another evil robot like the foot soldiers. So, you know, this causes a problem now because Leo, Raph, and Mike have to go search for Usagi while Don heads back down to the lab in the sewers. Um, you know, Donatello needs to study that power pack. 
Eventually, Usagi gives up on chasing after the motorcyclist, and he enters the rabbit hutch, where he is mistaken for an employee. Now, this is one of my, uh, I, I think this is pretty funny. I always like this, you know, Usagi working in this crappy bunny joint. He mistakes his co-workers for his brothers, and uh, eventually he, uh, he leads a revolution, you know. <laughs> He believes they're slaves, and, uh, you know, he is trying to, he tries to liberate them. Now, the Rabbit Hutch Rebellion, you know, starts off cute enough with, you know, mostly a food fight, but then I thought things got carried away a little bit whenever Usagi decided to disembowel the employer there. As I said, I always thought this was pretty funny. Uh, eventually, Mikey finds him and, uh, you know, brings him back to the turtles. Down in the sewers! Donatello uses the power pack to learn that the foot soldiers are converging in little Tokyo town. Um, this is where Splinter says that, uh, you know, they're heading towards the far eastern animal mu museum. Or as it's later, you know, shown on the sign, far eastern animal society. Splinter says the animal museum houses a collection of mystical oriental relics, all related to animals. And luckily, Splinter knows the guardian there, Obento-san. Now, before the, uh, you know, the guys can go grab Obento and help him out or, you know, stop some kind of foot soldier invasion into his home, the foot soldiers break in and uh, grab a giant vase that Obento keeps referring to as Baby-san, and they kidnap Obento. Why does he keep on referring to the vase as Baby-san? Well, the foot soldiers take baby son to uh, a giant smokestack and they uh, open up the vase to reveal that there is a giant egg inside wow they then drop that egg into the giant smokestack donatello uses the radar in the turtle van to track down the foot soldiers who kidnapped obento and uh, you know he says that they are headed towards the midtown power plant and just as the turtles arrive bam a dragon is born. The guys are a little dumbfounded at first. Splinter says that they must find Obento's son, since he is the only one who can control the dragon. Uh, Splinter, Don, and Usagi go in the turtle van and head off to save him, while the other guys do what they can to distract the dragon. As Mikey, Raph, and Leo begin their most perilous adventure and babysitting, um, they realize that the dragon is hungry. And Mikey suggests that, you know, they should feed him the grains out of the, uh, you know, those, those big grain holders. What do you call them? I wasn't raised in a barn. So the guys tried to feed the dragon in hopes of distracting him, you know, like Mikey planned. But, uh, you know, it, it has a very negative effect because instead of, you know, filling the dragon up and maybe making him fall asleep or something like that, instead, it makes him grow in size. Take a look at that pink bandana turtle. That's supposed to be Raph. So, while Leo, Mikey, and Raph, you know, party with the dragon or whatever, Donatello, Splinter, and Usagi find Obento, who was about to be punished by catapult. Um, Usagi gets another chance to kill some more foot soldiers. You know, I like how Donnie and Splinter just kind of like tap the foot soldiers to knock them out. And Usagi, you know, cuts off their heads. Obento's son says that they have to go back to the animal museum to get the blue flame of Osaka because the blue flame may be the only way to stop baby son. For some unknown reason, the other turtles decide to listen to another one of Mikey's plans. And uh, what's Mikey's plan this time? Well, he decides to lead the dragon using the grain into a, uh, I guess, a furnace. Is that what he's planning? Is he planning on killing the dragon, or was he just going to try to lock him in there? Because, I mean, it's filled with flame. Um, but, of course, Mikey's plan backfires, and instead of the flame killing the dragon, the dragon eats the flame, and then he gets the ability to spit flame at the Ninja Turtles. Don't ever listen to Mikey. He's a pizza-filled moron. So the dragon goes on a little rampage through the city, um, you know, he melts some foot soldiers, which is pretty cool. And, uh, you know, just as the military is about to blast him into smithereens, Obento and the crew show up with the blue flame. Uh, Obento says that in order to save Baby Son, 
the blue flame must be placed in his mouth. So Usagi heroically volunteers and, uh, you know, he manages to throw the flame in baby son's mouth on the first try. As this episode ends, Shredder learns of Usagi's existence. Uh, Usagi moves in with Obento and uh, Donatello says, you know, he'll do what he can to uh, you know, send Usagi back to his home, um, even if it'll take him 20 years. Does it take Donatello 20 years? No one knows. Usagi only appeared in one other episode, and in that episode, he didn't go home. I do want to say that, uh, you know, this this is a fun episode. You know, I, I like this one. Uh, the dragon always sticks out in my mind, you know, and plus just Usagi, you know. The, mute, the episodes that feature mutant characters or side characters from the toy line are usually my favorite um, classic Ninja Turtle episodes. Another reason why this episode sticks out in my head is because, uh, you know, of those old Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle cards by Tops. This episode was printed in the, the second series with the cool black border. Not only was it fun back then to try to collect all these cards, it was also just fun to, you know, check out the episode. You know, even though I didn't have it on tape or whatever, I could remember what happened just by looking at the pictures and reading the descriptions on the back. So... Two days later, uh, the sequel premiered on November 9th, 1989. The title of that episode, Usagi Come Home. The episode begins exactly where the last episode left off. Obento accepting Usagi into his home. You know, somehow the Shredder is watching this uh, in the Technodrome. You know, maybe he's got a spy fly in there. Who knows? But what's really funny is the Shredder says... It's that blasted rabbit again, which would be kind of weird, you know, since he only uh, just learned about him like at the end of the last episode. But things get even weirder when uh, Krang shows up in the room and he's like watching reruns of uh, your past failures. What? So he's seen this tape before. Uh, does he does he say that every time he watches the tape like he sounded like. He was surprised to see him, but, you know, he already knew that it was that blasted rabbit. That's like if every time I watched Alien, I was like, it's that blasted alien again. So basically, Shredder is watching this Usagi tape and he's planning how he'll turn him uh, into an ally, you know, that way he can finally destroy the turtles once and for all. Shredder heads to the surface with Bebop and Rocksteady, and when Obento goes shopping alone, for uh, some food for the animals, including 20 pounds of carrots for Usagi, the villainous fiends kidnap him. Down in the turtle lair, Donatello is trying to home in on Usagi's home dimension, but uh, all he gets is the planet of the rubber bands and the planet of the vending machines. Well, junk food. Uh, back up top, Shredder visits Usagi, and he tells him that, uh, you know, I captured your buddy Obento, and the only way that uh, he'll remain safe is if uh, you help me destroy the turtles. Usagi, of course, rejects the, the Shredder's bargains, you know, stating that to take four lives in exchange for one is dishonorable. So, the Shredder challenges him to a duel. If Usagi wins, Shredder will free Obento. And if the Shredder wins, Usagi must kill the turtles. Usagi accepts, you know, believing that there's no way the Shredder can defeat him. Uh, and Shredder must, you know, not have any faith in himself because, uh, you know, he cheats. He has Bebop throw a watermelon on his head. Ah, oh, the slapstick technique. And then uh, Bebop uses a giant magnet to pull away his swords. How come the Shredder's sword doesn't become magnetized as well? Uh, anyway, Usagi loses. Back down in the sewers... The guys put on their winter disguises, and they head to Obento's. Man, what a coincidence. Donatello believes that uh, Usagi can help him find Usagi's home dimension. But on their way, they get attacked by Usagi. Usagi apologizes, but, you know, there's nothing he can do. He's honor-bound to kill them. So, he cuts a pipe, and water floods the sewer. Now, how did the water strip the guys of their clothes and put on their headbands. 
It's questions like these that keep me up at night. Uh, you know, I like this battle. I like that the, the turtles, you know, do what they can to protect themselves, but um, refuse to fight back. Uh, eventually, they go to the surface, and, uh, you know, Usagi runs into some traffic, and I laughed my head off when Leo yelled, Be careful! Look both ways! The guys follow Usagi into a shopping mall, and, you know, some cool things happen here. You know, I like when Usagi gets trapped on an escalator. Um, you know, of course, this episode takes place around Easter, so kids in the mall have bunny ears on their heads, and uh, parents think that the Easter bunny went berserk and is attacking people. The guys try to stop Usagi by flying some toy planes at them. You know, don't they know that that's not going to stop him? The only way they can stop him is by throwing a pizza on it in his face. Um, you know, eventually, they do get the drop on Usagi, and they manage to trap him in the sewers, only momentarily. All while this is happening, Bebop and Rocksteady are scouring the city for um, as much fuel as they can find. They want to take it back to the Technodrome and use it to raise the metallic monolith out of its molten magma-filled prison. Now, there's, there seems to be an overabundance of coincidences here because coincidentally, after they steal a mountain of fuel, not to mention a, a fuel tanker, they overhear one of April's newscasts. April is talking to Dr. Rufus Winterbottom of Acme Research. Dr. Winterbottom is uh, unveiling his new discovery, an additive which supercharges ordinary fuel. You know, April, sometimes, you know, your mouth, shut it. You live in a world filled with supervillains, all right? You know, maybe you don't have to report every super fuel, death ray, easy, easily manipulated alien life form, super powered uh, satellite, uh, super serum, teleportation device, and, you know, really just any type of weapon of mass destruction, you know? Keep all that shit on the DL, you know? And, you know, I would tell you to, like, you know, go report on, like, a cat or something like that, but, uh, you know, you'd probably screw that up, too. This is April O'Neil with Channel 6 News. I'm down at Central Park where locals have discovered a brand new species of cat. Let's see if we can find it for ourselves. Whoa, jeez, you're a big fella. I bet if someone of the evil persuasion saw you, they'd want to use you to carry out their diabolical ways. They could use you to eat kids, destroy buildings, fight the turtles, break into a bank or a science research facility where they store diseases and weapons that we can't even imagine. Hopefully they don't see this news report, you know. We don't need them to do anything evil, right? <laughs> All right, so Bebop and Rocksteady go steal Dr. Winterbottom's supercharger because of course they do. I mean, seriously, uh, like does no one in this world hire anybody for security other than like their 80 year old grandmother? Uh, back on the turtle side of things, the turtles go to the Far East Animal Museum to uh, look for Obento, but they find the place in shambles. Plus Donatello, finds this giant magnet. Now, wait a minute. Look at it here, and then look at it when Bebop used it earlier. I mean, it must have ate some grain or something. Usagi returns home, and he attacks the guys. During the midst of battle, he finally tells them that, you know, he must destroy them because the Shredder beat him in a duel. And, you know, that's when Donatello's like, Look, dummy, uh, Shredder totally tricked you. Finally, Usagi's attack ends, and the guys become friends again. Uh, so, you know, what do they do? They team up to stop the Shredder. Back at the Shredder's base, Rocksteady uses the supercharger on a toy robot. Look at it go! Then Bebop smashes it with a sledgehammer. Man. All right, so Usagi shows up carrying the guys who are pretending to be dead. And Shredder tells Usagi to go put them in another room so he can deal with them later. What's he going to do? Is he a taxidermist? Does he plan on stuffing them and setting them up like trophies in the Technodrome? 
when Usagi takes him into the other room, uh, he cuts their ropes with this little dagger. Again, that little dagger that wasn't included with this toy, but it looks like the same one that he had pulled out of uh, his katana. Usagi then goes to ask the Shredder for Obento-san's freedom, you know, now that he's completed his task of destroying the Ninja Turtles. But, oh my gosh, big shocker, the Shredder, the king of the Double Cross, asks Usagi uh, to swear his loyalty or Obento perishes. Oh man, can't believe he did that. Of course, Usagi rejects the Shredder's offer and he attacks so that's when Bebop uses this uh, this horseshoe shooter, or is it a giant stapler, to uh, staple Usagi to the wall. Um, you know, Bebop actually uses this in the season four episode, Farewell Lotus Blossom. It looks a little different, but, you know, it's pretty much the same, you know, idea. And in that episode, he uses it to uh, pin down Lotus. So, uh... Shredder, you know, he's going to go shoot Usagi, but, like, look how he holds the gun. Like, it's it's weird to see him actually hold it up like that and look in the scope, because most of the times, like, the foot soldiers of Bebop and Rocksteady just, you know, shoot them all willy-nilly. Before Shredder is able to blast Usagi into the next dimension, the turtles rush in, and they save the day. How do they defeat the villains? By beating them to a pulp in a, a battle of martial arts? No, by shooting fireworks at them. Also, the Shredder threatens to use the supercharger against them, and somehow Donnie knows to knock over all the vials and pick up the exact vial. Like, he knows that this, no, this Shredder, this is the vial of supercharger, which he then uses to power up more fireworks, you know? Of course. In the end, the villains escape, and everyone goes back to the Animal Museum to, uh, to uh, teach you Soggy about... The Joys of Pizza. I think this episode is decent, um, but I definitely like the first episode a whole lot more. Um, you know, there are things I do like, like I like the battles between Usagi and the Turtles. I think those are all pretty cool and um, humor-filled. Um, and, uh, you know, I do like the Usagi-Shredder battle, you know. That was pretty fun to watch, too. Um, so, you know, Usagi is still stuck on Earth, all right? You know, he's stuck here indefinitely. And this is the last we ever get to see him in the cartoon. Like, that's such a bummer. It really would have been cool to have just, like, a third one, you know? Make it a trilogy, right? Have the third episode where Usagi gets to go home. Or maybe at least include him in, like, you know, a few of the bigger episodes, like a season finale or something like that. You know, something where the stakes are really high and you need Usagi to jump in to help the Ninja Turtles. Like, could you imagine if he would have showed up in Night of the Rogues? Like, you could have had Casey and Usagi versus Chrome Dome. Now that would have been awesome. You know, why is this episode called Usagi Come Home? You know, it sounds kind of like Usagi, like, left or got kidnapped or something like that and obento son like needed the turtles help to find usagi and finally that is all i have to say about the the cartoons and now we get to talk about the action figure but first we have to compare the action figure to the cartoon <laughs> Let's go from comic book to cartoon to action figure. That way you can see how, you know, how good of a job they, uh, you know, translated this guy to film and then to 3D in your hand, all right? So in the original comic book, uh, you know, he wears a blue kimono and he has uh, the symbol of Lord Mifune on both sides of his chest. And he also has the symbol on um, both of his sleeves, all right? Uh, if you look at the cartoon you can see that he has all that there it is and then you can look at the action figure and again all four spots there he has that symbol uh, and then if you look at the back you can see he has the symbol right in the middle of his back um, in the cartoon you can also see that symbol on his back and in the comic book you can see that he has the symbol on his back you know and there's not really much to Osagi's um, you know, uniform or his samurai clothes to really cover here. But uh, in the comic book, you know, he wears... In, on the pages, it looks like they are just black pants. 
all right? And he's kind of got like a, you know, a white belt, all right? So in the cartoon, they gave him more of a, uh, a grayish belt, and they kept the black pants. And here you can see the action figure, and he has all of that. Now, unfortunately, when you put his... um his scabbards on his belt. They they give you a black belt. So we will see what that looks like in a little bit. But uh, for now, it looks good. You know, it looks like it's supposed to with that gray uh, belt and the black pants. Plus, he also has these, um, these uh, sandals. If you look at Usagi's head in the comic book, uh, what shape would you say that is? Is that sort of like a, a gumdrop shape? A gumdrop with melty sides. That's why you have like the the scruffy cheeks, I guess. Um, you know, Stan has a very consistent look for Usagi. He usually draws the same shaped head, I guess. Um, when he draws Usagi Yojimbo, I think he kind of draws his face a little smaller inside of the head, a little lower, um, giving him a uh, like a bigger upper head or something like that. Um, his I guess his ears are a little tall, but skinny, you know, and he always has that predominant one eyebrow. All right. You know, that's Usagi always has that eyebrow. I read somewhere that that was like a scar, but I mean, he's had that since he's like a kid in the in the comic book. So I don't even know if that was just like something somebody came up with or if that actually does turn out to be something later on. Sometimes Usagi can look uh, elegant or, you know, uh, stoic, I guess. And then other times, Stan will draw Usagi with, like, crazy expressions, you know, where he's angry or, like, you know, goofy or something like that. You know, I, I what I like about Stan's artwork in these Usagi Yojimbo comic books is they're very cartoony. You know, there's a lot of squash and stretch happening in on all the pages. In some ways, it's even more cartoony than the Fred Wolf series because, you know, lots of times those old 80s cartoons... They had to be a little stiff, you know, they didn't use the same kind of Looney Tunes animation. Uh, so when you look at Usagi in the um, the Fred Wolf series, um, you know, they kind of softened his face out a little bit. His, his head is a little skinnier. Um, he still has the scruffy cheeks. I think they stretched his face out a little bit. You know, it kind of fills in that head more than it does in the original comic books. Um, you know, his ears, again... They're not like huge or anything like that, but they're kind of skinny. Um, and then when you come to the action figure here, uh, I think they did a pretty decent job here of matching how he looks in that Fred Wolf series. Um, you know, he still has the um, the pronounced eyebrow that came from the comic to the cartoon to this toy. You got that. I feel like his uh, the shape of his head is very similar. It's not the same as the original Stan Sakai Usagi Ojimbo. He's got those huge blue eyes. What I think is really cool about this Usagi Ojimbo is that he has a very nice um, fur texture on his head. I think that really stands out. Um, the only thing I would say is his ears do not appear as tall or maybe as skinny as they do in all the other um, versions of uh, Usagi Ojimbo. Now, I do want to mention this too. Sometimes Stan uh, will draw Usagi in a profile. And I feel like the way that his head is shaped there, it doesn't look like the same Usagi, you know, like the profile just does not match the way he draws like a straightforward pose or straightforward face of Usagi Yojimbo. Um, like if you look at the, the toy here, um, you can kind of see how it kind of sticks out and stuff a certain way <laughs> that, uh, you know, I just think looks a, a little nicer. They did include this extra head, which I think looks really nice because uh, it gives you a more aggressive looking Usagi Yojimbo uh, for when he's, you know, chopping foot soldiers up with his uh, katana. Um, and then you also do have these uh, laid back ears, which, you know, he never has those ears like that in the cartoon. But, you know, you need these ears for, you know, when you're putting the hood on his head or uh, when you want to put the, the hat on his head. I should mention, on both heads, his uh, ears are not centered. Um, they're off to the side just a little bit. I thought, you know, maybe it could have been a mistake on the one head, but once I saw it was on both heads, I was like, oh, every single person's Usagi's uh, ears must be a little off-center like that. Up next is scale. In the cartoon, Usagi looks around 
three and a half to uh, four heads tall. I've counted around both. Uh, this action figure does exactly that. He looks like he is about one, two, three, about four, you know, three, three, three fourths or four, you know, whatever. As I said before, I think uh, proportionally his face looks pretty close to how he appears in the cartoon, except you actually have more of a, a 3D look happening here. When compared to the Ninja Turtles, I would say that, uh, you know, he... I would say the top of his head is around their mouth lines. Sometimes it's a little bit of a, a tough call, but, you know, he is taller than Splinter, and... Um, you know, when compared to the Shredder, he is, uh, well, the Shredder is a lot bigger than Ugasagi Ojimbo. I kind of like, I don't know, kind of think that is the top of his head is around uh, the middle of the Shredder's pecs or something. I don't know. It's, it's, it's hard to tell. Um, if you come back here, you can look and see how he scales with these guys. Um, you know, he is not that much taller than Splinter. They're about the same size. Um, with Leonardo, does he reach Leonardo's mouth? No, not really. He's, he's, he looks like he's about sh shoulder uh, height. I mean, he's supposed to be smaller than the guys, and he is definitely supposed to be smaller than the Shredder. All right, so on to articulation. So this guy has pretty much your standard NECA articulation. Nothing really new here. Um, but I like how they they don't necessarily conceal the joints. But I like how everything kind of flows on this guy, you know. Sometimes when you have big baggy clothes like this, joints can look really weird. Like like if you looked at like um, Hasbro's Ghostbusters, like their knee joints were like all weird and out of whack and stuff like that. But I do like the way that these are shaped. Um, so from top to the bottom here, you have a, you know, an ear joint here, so you can twist his ears around. The uh, the head here, there's a ball joint at the base of the head, so you can look all over the place. Plus you have another ball joint here at the uh, the uh, the shoulders. Speaking of shoulders, you have um, a hinge and um, rotation here. Now his uh, kimono doesn't actually get in the way that much. I mean, like, it's vinyl, it sticks out a little bit, but it doesn't really um, hinder any of the movement that you would want him to have. Um, his elbows can rotate. Now, this kind of does get a little weird because you do have that little lip there sticking off, so that doesn't, you know, move as good, but, I mean, you're only going to want to rotate it so much anyways. And you have the hinge there. Now, if you look in here inside of the sleeve, you can see that they included like a little white arm, which is cool. You know, it's not like, you know, you remember like some toys would just have like sort of like flat, like the end of like a sleeve would just be sort of like flat. And then the hand would just kind of be like plugged into it. I think that this really creates a nice illusion here of depth, you know, that the sleeve does go in a little bit and the arm is sticking out. Um, so the hand uh, has rotation and it's hinged, you know, all good stuff. Now, I don't think, it feels like there's probably a little bit of articulation here in the upper torso, but you can't really move it at all. I don't know. It's, I feel like I'm getting some kind of movement there. But who knows? Um, the waist rotates. This is like one of those things, though, but if you like started to rotate him around, you'd probably get some weird shapes. You can lean backwards. That doesn't really leave too much of a gap that it looks weird because there's a little bit of black up top here and the shirt is up a little bit, but you can kind of pretend in your head that the shirt is sort of like tucked into the pants. Um, kind of like how it is. <laughs> I don't know. He's, he doesn't have a lot of forward and back rotation in the, the hip or the, the waist here. All right, so the hips. Oh my gosh, it's too hard. Um, the hips here, you have a ball joint, and plus you have an extra rotation here at the top of the hip, which is nice. Now, I will show a pose, because I was curious. You know, in that cartoon, he kicks one of those um, pig samurais, and I was wondering, you know, how good of a kick can he actually get? 
and like be able to support himself. So we will take a look at that in a second. Um, his knees are single jointed knees. And like I said, I think these are done really well. You know, it doesn't look goofy. It looks like it holds its mass really well. Like it's not like collapsing in upon itself or something strange. It looks good. It's a good knee. Um, the ankles here have a hinge and they rotate. Um, and you have peg holes on the bottom of them, I guess. So you can, uh, you know, if you're trying to get him into some crazy martial arts pose, maybe you might have to plug him into something. So, let's see here. Without having to use a peg, you can really get Usagi into a, a high kick stance. I mean, look at him. I'm surprised he's not toppling over. Uh, I think some of it is because, you know, you have these huge uh, feet. Um... Because I think any other guy, if you were trying to get one of your Ninja Turtles to, to do this kind of high kick, they'd be falling over like you couldn't imagine. So, you know, this is pretty cool. You know, it's cool that you could be able to get Usagi to get into this and, you know, maybe have him kick some uh, giant mutant characters right in the gut. Are you still here? Hello? Where would everybody go? Man, did, did everybody leave when I started talking about the comic books? I get so carried away, I just... I gotta stop this. All right, so if you are still here, you know, I think this guy is really awesome. You know, I think his sculpt is really good and I think his articulation works really well. I think that uh, he'll make any Ninja Turtle fan happy as well as, you know, any Usagi Yojimbo fan. You know, I wonder how many diehard Usagi fans first learned of him because of his uh, connection with the Ninja Turtles. I hope that put a lot of dough in Stan Sakai's pocket. All right, so on to my favorite part, accessories. The first accessory we have to talk about is Usagi's scabbards or his his uh, sword sheaths or uh, as I would have called them as a kid, his sword holders. Check out this cool sword holder I put on my belt, you know, something like that. So. Here's the thing, right? You look at this and you're like, well, well, how's that supposed to go there? Like, it just falls. What are you supposed to do? Well, <laughs> you're supposed to use this belt that was included with Usagi. Now, I've seen a couple people on Facebook post that they did not know how to put the scabbards on his belt. because, And I was confused, too, until I opened up the bag with, um, uh, with his cloak. Because in the same bag with his cloak... There was a belt um, to go around the cloak, and then there's also this extra belt to go around his waist. Um, so we will take a look at that. But first, I do want to mention this, that uh, originally what I was going to do was, uh, before I found out about that belt, is I was going to use this white hair tie that I stole from my wife to um, put it around his waist. Because the white at least matches the outfit a little more this black one is uh it doesn't match but we'll see here we'll see how it looks so i was able to get this belt in a good place you know there seems to be a pretty decent amount of um pressure being applied to the scabbards to keep them in the place they're not slipping around or anything like that which is good you know in the comic book sometimes usagi actually uses the the scabbards to like whack people um and also his sword uh, you know, you probably won't be able to do that. You probably won't be able to get him to hold these things. I would imagine you'll probably always want him to have these, uh, scabbards on his belt. I don't know, pretty cool. I guess now that I do have it, like, stuck underneath his, uh, his gut here, or whatever you want to call it, um, the black band coming out is not that, it's not jarring, you know, because you still see the, um, the lighter colored belt. You know, it didn't really cover that up at all. So I think that is fine. I just kind of wish that it would have been a, uh, a brighter color. One type of pose you'll see Usagi do every now and then in the comic books, and also a few times on the cartoon, is uh, he'll hold the scabbards with his left hand to like lift them up into place, and then take his right hand to grab his katana. Now, because he only has single-jointed elbows, you can't really get the reach you need to... Um, pull this off correctly like it's kind of tough to get the scabbards into this hand and then this hand just does not reach in far enough to uh to lay it on top of the the handle of the katana we may as well continue talking about the swords right so usagi uses these two swords to uh kill 
many a foot soldier. Well, mostly he just uses the, the katana. You know, I only remember him pulling out the wakazashi in this shot, and, you know, he doesn't do much with it at all. Um, I think these swords look really nice. I think that they, um, I think they fit his scale. I mean, all you really care about is, you know, how cool does he look while fighting foes? And I think these look, these look cool enough. Um, the style of the handle is similar, but it is a little different. Like, this part up here is the same shape as it appears in the cartoon. I don't know what kind of shape you call that. Is it like a, would you call that like a flower <laughs> or something? But then if you looked at the bottom of the handle... Um, this toy, it's just completely flat. You know, it's just like a ring going across the bottom. Um, in the cartoon, it's a little more stylized. You know, it sort of has that, like, lip or whatever that's sort of coming up in the middle of the handle. I'm just glad that Usagi is able to hold both of these with his hands. You know, there's nothing that drives you crazier than getting an action figure with hands that can't hold the weapons. So, fun fact here. Um, in the comic books, Usagi won these swords in a fencing tournament where he had to defeat the best students of the Dagora, Dagora School of Bujitsu. They were gifted to him by the great Lord Mafune, the man who would later become his master for a short period of time before he was defeated in battle, which is why Usagi is now a masterless ronin. Um, the Wakazashi is named Aoyani, which means Young Willow, and the katana is named Yano Ida, 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 <laughs> which, which means Willow Branch. I am very sorry for butchering those words, you know, but I'm, I'm trying to do what I can. You know, I'm a Polish person who, uh, who called General Kosciuszko General Koszkiesko for 34 years of his life, all right? In fact, Everybody in my hometown calls it because we have Koshkiesko Street. And, like, everybody says it. Teachers, my grandparents, my parents. That's what everybody thinks it is. The next weapon is the Qatar. Qatar. Uh, this was uh, not in the show. It looks pretty awesome, though. Um, and I, as of yet, I have not seen it in any of the Usagi Yojimbo comics. Um, but it was in the original toy line. You know, the original Usagi came with one of these, only back then it was called a fist dagger. So this is cool because this is, you know, NECA's way of putting this uh, Playmates toy in this toy line. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be here, but they snuck it in. Now what's interesting is um, only a few years ago, Super 7 included this with, uh, I mean, I guess, when was the last time, when did Donatello come out? I think that was last year. Um, they included one with, uh, you know, all four of their turtles, and I think, uh, the, I think the Shredder, too. Um, so you can see the, uh, the, the Super 7 Ultimates version of this. Now, look how, you know, this is, like, in my opinion, the part of the problem with Super 7's uh, Ultimates. Like, I love those toys. I think they look great. I like a lot of the accessories and the weapons, but they have pretty much made every single weapon almost like the same size as the original weapon. All right, that came out back in the 80s, which doesn't make sense because these figures are like way bigger, but the weapons have stayed relatively the same size. And then you look at Usagi's, you know, uh, Qatar, Qatar, from this toy line, and it's a lot bigger. So this one will fit in Usagi's hands, and I'm sure it fits in the Ninja Turtles' hands too. Put that in there. Unfortunately, since his hand is sort of um, sculpted to kind of lean forward a little bit for his katanas, the this weapon kind of angles downward, you know. So you're going to have to, like, hold it up higher for him to attack people. And if you were curious, um, this actually fits in the Ninja Turtle Ultimates hand really well. Um, that actually looks pretty good there. And the Ultimates one does fit in Usagi's hand. But again, because of the way his hand is sculpted... Uh, you have to angle, I mean, you have to put his arm up pretty high there to get a, a straight attack. Up next is the kunai, which is a throwing dagger. And, you know, I just love this thing because obviously this reminds me of two things, all right? It reminds me of the best damn Sega Genesis game ever, Shinobi 3. You know, <laughs> you're throwing these things at people. And then, of course, it reminds me of uh, Scorpion from Mortal Kombat. Look, it even has a ring at the end here so you can attach a rope to it. 
Uh, so that is pretty cool. Um, you can fit it in his hand, of course. You know, I have not seen Usagi use one of these in the comic books. He definitely does not use it in the cartoon. But I have seen this in the comic books. You know, it is there. Um, he actually gets one of these thrown into his arm in the story, The Confession. That's gotta hoit. And then he still, you know, continues to slaughter an army of ninjas. What a trooper. Usagi comes with two heads. You have the more mild-mannered, more reserved Usagi head with the closed mouth, and then you just have this more angry-looking Usagi with the the angry eyes and the showing of his teeth, you know, like he's... This is the Usagi you want to have whenever he's, you know, chopping up the foot soldiers in half and all that kind of stuff. Removing the head can be kind of annoying because uh, when I pulled this out, it pulled out of the neck instead of the base of the head. You see the uh, the other head here, you know, just has the hole in the bottom of it. So you're going to have to use like a pair of tweezers or something like that to try to pull that out or pliers, you know. And then sometimes when you try to remove the head, you might accidentally pull out the whole neck. So finally, I got this alternate head on Usagi's body, and, you know, it wasn't easy. It really wasn't easy. Because it's a rod, you know, and there's a ball at the end of it, so when you try to put it in the hole, it just keeps on getting pushed to the side, you know? Uh, so you gotta do what you can to try to apply equal pressure straight in the middle to get it in there, you know? It's, it's a pain in the neck. But these, these are the hardships of a collector, right? <laughs> So, you know, for me, it's a tough call which head I think looks better for, like, you know, to pose him all the time because I feel like this is more of his natural personality that you usually see in the cartoon. And this one, obviously, is way better for, you know, attacking and fighting. And I do, I am glad that they did give you this, you know, extra set of ears so that you can, um, you know, put the hood on top of his head and also the hat. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you have interchangeable ears because you could put these new ones in here. It's a big pig. Oh my gosh. There we go. Now that looks awesome. Up next you have Usagi's cloak and uh, it even has a, uh, a belt here. Um, so I think the cloak is a nice material. You know, I think it looks nice. The stitching is all right. It's still like, you know, sometimes you get these clothes and it looks really good. I think this looks good, but I do think that the large stitching makes it appear more of like a, you know, more of like a toy than an actual natural piece of clothing on top of him. Uh, let's see how easy it is to get him into this thing. Now, so far, it conceals him pretty well. I think maybe the sleeves could have been a little longer, you know, uh... Uh, in the cartoon, I think, you know, it looks like he's got this big baggy cloak on him. Um, the sleeves appear long. Here, the sleeves just kind of appear a little short. I was trying to hide the um, the swords in here, but it probably would work best is if you take them out. Um, just because they were adding a little bit too much of a, a bulge <laughs> over there. Now, this is one of the items where you need the slicked back ears. So pop those ones out, put this one in, and then boom. You can uh, have your Usagi, you know, hidden in this uh, hood. The hood, there's a wire in here, which is nice, so you can kind of, you know, wrap that around his head as loosely or as open as you want. Let's see here, tie the belt around him. So in my honest opinion, um, I don't know, it fits him okay, but I just don't, it doesn't look, um, there's something off about it, all right? As I said, I feel like the arms are a little too short. You know, it just doesn't look like it naturally confines to his body. Like, there are some characters, like I think Splinter had a really nice um, uh, fabric kimono, or I think that's what he wears, kimono. But this is just a little too big. Or something. You know what would have been nice is if they would have had some kind of connecting pieces here so that you could kind of connect it around his body. Because as of right now, like it kind of pulls away. Plus, I think the hood is just a little too small. Um, because the, the way the hood is, even if you try to um, bend the wires 
like he, I don't know. It just doesn't hide his appearance as well as um, you know you would hope if you uh, remember looking at him in the cartoon. But you know that's just my opinion. You know maybe you like it. <laughs> All right, another item for the slicked back ears. This uh, very nice looking uh, straw hat. Uh, I think the paint is really nice. I think the detail all looks really good. Um, the black lines look like they are in place. I like it. The only thing that, you know, kind of worries me is over time, I could see this string breaking. Like, I have no faith in this string whatsoever. It's just a very thin piece of rubber, you know, that's connected to the uh, this much sturdier hat. So unfortunately, it's only a matter of time, in my opinion. Until you see that thing go. Um, it fits his head pretty well. You know, I think that looks good. Now, in the cartoon, he does not wear this type of hat at all. But uh, in the comic books, you know, he has them uh, right on the first page. He's wearing this type of hat. And then he lifts it up to reveal who he is. Last up, you have the Tokage. Uh, which is a type of lizard, you know. These guys appear all over the place in the comic books, uh, but unfortunately not in the cartoon. I think this guy looks really great, you know. I believe that his first appearance was in the um, the second Usagi storyline, uh, Lone Rabbit and Child. Throughout the comic book, you know, these guys can be used either to, you know, fill up the background, or add like a, a sense of humor or, you know, whatever you want, you know. I really like these little guys and, uh, you know, other than them, I can't think of any other animals I've seen in the Usagi Ojimbo comics. I'll have to go back and check. Um, you know, I think pro proportionately this toy looks just like he did in the comic book. You know, sometimes the arms in the comic book almost appear like human arms because they look buff or something like that. But I think this all looks great. I honestly wouldn't mind getting like two or three more of these guys in different stances. Um, you know, even though he's not uh, in the Fred Wolf series, I feel like he will mix in extremely well with your Fred Wolf action figures. One final thing to go over, you have Usagi's hands, all right? He's got six hands, um, pretty much three sets. You know, they pretty much look like they're mirrored both sides. So the right and the left are the same, all right? You have uh, a pair of grabbing hands or gripping hands. And as I showed you, these are able to hold every single weapon included with the Zusagi Yojimbo action figure, which is great. You have these um, these open palm hands or these expressive hands. Uh, you know, these work great, you know, for all different types of moods. He could either be conveying emotion or you can use them to uh, uh, accentuate um, different martial arts poses or something, you know. And then, he, of course, he's got a set of fists, which is great, too, because sometimes you just want him to sock a guy right in the face. You know, what if he drops his swords? He's got to use something else. He's either got to kick him or punch him. And after that, you know, are there any missing items? Well, uh, you know, some type of nod to baby son would have been okay. You know, if they would have included maybe like a picture on the, the box or, you know, even a little item. Like, I mean, obviously you couldn't include, like, you'll, you'll probably never see an actual in scale or, you know, bigger size dragon in this action figure line. Uh, but you know, they could have included like the blue flame of Osaka, you know, just to remind you of those scenes. You know, I'm not saying that they had to have this, you know, it's not like he, this action figure gets any negative points for me because they don't uh, include these because you know, this is just like extra stuff that, you know, from those episodes, these are some of the other items I can point out, all right? Um, the one big thing that, you know, they could have included that they didn't in my opinion, is the dagger Usagi pulls out of his katana handle. Um, you know, obviously that is different than the Wakazashi. Um, it looks different. It's got a different type of handle. Um, and, uh, you know, you didn't need to have like an action feature with the katana because it's a little tiny item. It would have been hard to, you know, put a little tiny dagger in there. But maybe you could have just included the dagger itself. I mean, he also did use it in Usagi Come Home to, uh, you know, cut the ropes attached to the turtles. And then, you know, they're like, you know, unrelated to Usagi, uh, what I do think that they should release in the future is that cool um, giant stapler that Bebop uses in this episode and then also uh, Farewell Blossom. Obviously, they have got somewhat different designs, but I think one of them needs to be made.
All right, so now we get to start the compare uh, Usagi across the different, uh, you know, Ninja Turtle toy lines and stuff like that. You know, just see what he looks like compared to the Ultimates and Playmates. And, of course, some other figures from this uh, Fred Wolf series. Now, here he is next to a bunch of guys. Now, I, I didn't include every single body type in this toy line um, just because I couldn't, you know, fit them all. Uh, but what I did do was I included every single action figure uh, that was a character in the original 1989 Playmates toy line, right? So you got Usagi, uh, Genghis, Con uh, Genghis Frog, uh, Krang and the Walker, Metalhead, Leatherhead, Ace Duck, Casey Jones, The Rat King, uh, Baxter Stockman, General Trag. Now with Usagi Yojimbo, the whole 1989 toy line is complete in the Fred Wolf form. Here he is next to two of uh, NECA's Mirage Ninja Turtles. And, uh, you know, I actually think this isn't that bad of a, a fit. You know, I think he actually fits in nice with these guys. Obviously, by the time Usagi was crossing over with the Ninja Turtles, their design had changed a little bit. Uh, by that time, they became a little more blocky, where here they're more exaggerated, I guess. You know, with their longer necks and their big, chunky feet. Um... Usagi wears the same exact clothes that he wears in the original Usagi Yojimbo comics, so you have that going for it. You have uh, the simple black lines. Um, he is cell shaded in the back there, but really, it's not even that noticeable because it's only on the uh, it's only on the kimono, the jacket, like the pants don't have that or anything. So, I mean, he fits in okay. Uh, I'm sure you'd probably want one with a, a face that matches more of Stan Sakai's style. But I think for what it is, it actually looks pretty good. Here he is next to a few of the Super 7 Ultimates. Man, he looks like a toddler next to these giant monsters. I think Super 7 may have said that they were having a hard time acquiring the rights to create an Usagi Yojibo Ultimate. Hopefully they uh, they do get those rights because we need an Usagi Yojimbo ultimate. I mean, come on. He was a big part of that original Playmates toy line. Here he is next to just a couple of the original Playmates action figures. Uh, he looks cool to the, next to them, but, you know, I mean, he's way too big. Finally, Usagi is taller than uh, one of these Ninja Turtle action figures. Here he is next to a few of Playmates... Uh, I guess, current Ninja Turtle action figures. They're old, but they're also current again. All right. Here he is next to two other Usagi Yojimbo toys. Now, that one is not mine. That's my son's. That's from the 2012 show. And then, of course, that is the original Playmates action figure. And I still love that Playmates action figure. I still think he's one of the one of the best, uh, you know, one, one of my favorite figures from way back when. There is one other figure, and that was from the 2003 series, but I do not have him, unfortunately. And that's it! I can't believe we got here, but we finally got here. I'm wrapping up this video on September 18th. I began shooting the first shot on August 30th, so it has been a long ways. Not as long as some of the other ones, but still long. And hopefully the next set, <laughs> hopefully the next review won't be three, uh, weeks away because my goodness gracious I will never get through all the stuff I have look at this this is everything in my possession right now and I have to get through them as quick as possible I mean geez uh super set from what I've seen super seven uh ninja turtle ultimates wave six is already in the states uh, I got a notification from big bad toy store saying my mouser pack has uh has arrived um, so hopefully won't, you know what, hopefully it doesn't take too long for Super 7 to send me the, the rest of Series 6, because I only ordered that mouser set from Big Bad Toy Store. I hope you, uh, enjoyed this video, you know, I was really excited to make this one because, you know, even though I'm a huge fan of Usagi Yojimbo, like, I knew nothing of his comic books or, uh, anything like that, so it was cool to, you know, uh, use this as an excuse to, um, learn more about this character, and, and as of right now, I'm trying to find myself a, a cheap copy of volume three the wanderer's road so you know i'll probably order that from amazon prime within the next few days all right so i gotta go so i can start working on my toka and razar review uh talk to you later have a good one and see ya <laughs>